that said, we're in chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 40 through 45, then pick up at chapter 2. In fact, this is really going to be like two different studies that I compressed into a single one. And seeing that the first service is always my guinea pig, here we go. Beginning at verse 40, reading to verse 45. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once, said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. So as we begin, let me lay a foundation and remind you of something that we've already looked at. Uh, we've seen that Jesus in his ministry here on earth, well, his ministry can be described by three words, by preaching and by teaching and by miracles. That's what Matthew told us in his gospel in Matthew 4.23 where Matthew said, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So he told us that Jesus did these three things. He tells us that Jesus taught. Jesus would teach in the synagogues. And when he would teach in the synagogues, I didn't share this with you, so I'll fill this in now. He would teach the people concerning himself and what he had come to do. For example, Luke tells us that when he was in the synagogue in Nazareth, that he stood up to read. And he was handed the book or the scroll of Isaiah, and he read from it to the people. He read in Luke 4, 18 through 21, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So when Jesus would speak and teach in the synagogue, he would point to himself. That's what he did. He would, ex he would point to himself as he expounded the scriptures. In John 5, 39, reading from the Amplified Bible, he said, You search and keep on searching and examining the scriptures, because you think that in them you have eternal life, and yet it is those very scriptures that testify about me. So when you hear that Jesus would teach in the synagogue, he was expounding the scriptures, and he was pointing to himself as the scriptures prophesied related to him. He also came preaching the kingdom. Now that came in conjunction with the teaching, because he was calling people according to Mark 1, 14 and 15 to repentance. So we had preached the, the scriptures, preached the kingdom, and finally, he came healing all kinds of sickness and disease. So part of the purpose of his miracles was to validate his claim that he was Messiah. In Acts 10.38, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And so he said in John 5, 36, Jesus said, I have testimony weightier than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I'm doing testify that the Father has sent me. So he came preaching, he came teaching, and he came working miracles. And these works were intended to draw people to faith in him because God had sent him to save them. And so Mark has already told us that Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases. We saw that in verse 34. So in this portion of Scripture, he records that Jesus is cleansing a leper. Now, we're going to see this in just a moment, that, that this is a very significant miracle because it causes his popularity to explode. So many came streaming to him that he could no longer openly enter into the city. Now, there are other passages that speak to the fact that Jesus healed many lepers. 
And that included, uh, that in, this incident rather is, is given more detail because this particular incident is very significant. And let me share something with you about leprosy. I'm, I'm laying foundations for you so that when you're reading your Bible, you have some insight into why these things are important. In Israel, leprosy was a symbol of sin. It was a type of sin because it began as a small spot, but it would progress over time. It's a picture of sin because in at first, leprosy is unseen being under the skin. It's under the surface. But what began as something insignificant could continue to grow until it took over the body, and the result would be in losing body parts, fingers and hands, arms, toes, feet, legs, the nose, the ear, could be lost to leprosy. And so it's a picture of sin because sin takes over the entire life, and spiritual rot is the final result. Now, leprosy resulted in the loss of feeling. The leper often would harm themselves without even knowing it. They could step on something, and they wouldn't feel it. And so sin also numbs us. It calluses our hearts to the point we no longer feel shame. And we see that in the society that we live in today. What at one time was done in secret is now done openly. What at one time would be hidden from people is now posted on social media. Opinions that we at one time felt were wrong but uh, kept them to ourselves are now posted as opinions. And so sin has a way of, of starting small, almost, well, invisibly to the naked eye, but eventually it takes over, and eventually it rots our entire body. Like sin, re leprosy resulted in isolation because the leper was separated from people. A leper could not have community relationships. A leper couldn't walk into a room like this. They were to be in isolation. In the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, in the Old Testament, it, it, it gives to us um, directions related to leprosy and all. And in Leviticus 13, 45 and 46, it says, The leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, his head bare, he shall cover his mustache, and so would the women, and cry, unclean, unclean, he shall be unclean. All the days he has a sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean. Now notice, and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So he had to proclaim his uncleanness in the event that somebody may be approaching him. He had to, he had to cover himself, claim, uh, exclaim that he was, uh, he was unclean, and people would avoid him. And he could not have any contact with people. During the day of Christ, some of the rabbis had become very harsh towards the leper. Some said no less than six feet must be kept from a leper, and he needs to wear a mask. Anyway, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't make that one up. And the leper said, uh, and it is said, some rabbis said 150 feet is not sufficient if there's a strong wind. Others threw stones at them while others hid from them when they heard the words unclean. The rabbis knew that no prayer, no offering, and no ritual could cleanse a leper. The law made it clear, only God cleanses lepers. And all a rabbi could do was to examine them and declare what had been done by God. And in the Bible, once again, leprosy is a dreaded disease that is a picture of sin. You might find this interesting. This is shown by the fact that he doesn't ask Jesus to heal him. He asks Jesus to cleanse him. And in these verses, four times, either the word clean, cleansed, or cleansing is used. He wasn't asking for a healing. He's asking for a cleansing because he is ritually unclean. And that's why they would say unclean, unclean. He couldn't go to a synagogue. He couldn't go to a temple. He couldn't be involved with other people. He couldn't have a life in the community. He's unclean. And now he comes to Jesus. And notice in verse 40 how it says, a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, 
saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This is a man who's rejected. He's normally rejected by everybody. Anybody who saw him would immediately pull away from him. He was, he was used to this because it happened to him all the time. And this was a case that even rabbis would withdraw from him. Well, he had heard of the fame of Jesus, and he came to a decision. He believed that Christ could make him clean, and he had faith that he would. So notice he comes to Christ, and even though he has been rejected by everybody, he comes near to him. Notice it says in verse 40, a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, when you look at the uh, companion uh, volume that the Gospel of Luke that, that speaks of the same incident in Luke 5.12, it, it tells us that Luke says that he was full of or covered by leprosy. His desperation had driven him to do what he wasn't allowed to do. He approached Christ in a city before a crowd of people. And this is, again, totally unlawful for him to do. He's not to be around people. He's not to be in the city. And he was, certainly isn't supposed to approach this rabbi. But in Numbers chapter 5, verse 2, another Old Testament book, it says, Command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous, and yet here he is, he's inside the city, he's there in the community, he's approaching Christ, and he begins to speak. And he's begging him, cleanse me. His need was so great, his prayer was filled with passion. It says in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. And that's what he's doing. He came and it, it didn't matter to him that, that he wasn't supposed to be there because the only thing that mattered to him at that moment was this rabbi, Jesus, I've heard that he's healing people. I've heard that he has miraculous power. I, I believe that he's able to cleanse me. And so he comes and he speaks to him and he says, please, and he does so with a passion and with a faith. And he says in verse 40, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I believe one thing. I believe that you can heal me. Now, Jews knew for absolute certainty that only God could cleanse a leper. But this man recognized Christ as having God's authority to heal. And he cried out to him. He said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You have the power, but I don't know if you're going to use it. I know you're able. I just don't know if you'll do it for me. You see, somebody wrote, God's will must never be confused with God's power. I know you have the ability, but what I am asking is, is it your will for you to do this? And so, God has all power, but his, oper his, his, his power is always operated through his will. And so, it says in verse 41, Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, no. No, he said, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him. He was cleansed. Now, can you imagine that for just a moment? Now, I want you to notice this. Jesus was moved uh, to action by his compassion. He was touched by his pain. In Hebrews 4.15, it says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And so Jesus has compassion. It speaks concerning him responding with it. Now imagine what the onlookers were thinking. This was completely out of what was accepted during that day. This man couldn't go to temple. He couldn't go to synagogue. He's unclean. He's completely cut off from family. He, he is cut off from his friends. He's cut off from people in general. He's not supposed to be around people, yet there he is. That would have outraged some of the people. Some of them, when they saw that, would have been moving away from him. Others would have watched to see what Jesus would do. So in touching him, Jesus himself could have been declared unclean. It says in Leviticus 5.3, if he touches human uncleanness, whatever sort his uncleanness may be with, with which he becomes unclean, and is, it is hidden from him, and he comes to know he'll be guilty. Yet Jesus was making a simple point. He was willing to touch someone that others refused to touch. Think about this for a moment. This man was covered with leprosy. It had taken time for his body to be filled with it. And this man had not had a human touch for some time. But Jesus touched him. 
in this recent COVID outbreak and so much that's going on related to it, you're not supposed to be coming near people. You're not supposed to be within, you know, there's so many mixed messages, it's difficult to really know anymore. But you're not supposed to have contact. You're not supposed to touch, be near, kiss, hold, and all of that. And that's, for those who've been blessed to be able to have survived and recovered, which is the majority, that uh, even the two weeks or so that you're in isolation, that you're not with people, is very difficult. It's a very difficult thing. Well, this man had gone through pretty much probably a good portion of a life and hadn't had human touch. That Jesus reaches and Jesus touches him. And notice in verse 40 how the man had said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And so to the an answering the question or statement, if you're willing, Jesus said, I am willing. To In answer to, you can make me clean, Jesus said, be cleansed. And verse 41 again tells us that he was moved with compassion. That word compassion, it means to suffer with or show mercy to. It speaks of showing pity, to suffer with. In other words, somebody wrote, compassion is someone else's pain becoming your pain. It's what motivates someone to alleviate the pain of somebody else. And compassion is something that God shows to his people. In Isaiah 49, 13, shout for joy, you heavens, rejoice, you earth, burst into song, you mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. And so the Lord is moved with compassion. You might want to underscore that because that's the heart of God towards you. God is moved with compassion. Your pain has become his pain. He shows you mercy. He shows you pity. He suffers alongside of you. And as the Lord Jesus Christ shows him compassion, reaches and touches and cleanses him by his touch, this leper is cleansed. And notice the cleansing's immediate. From a terrible condition, he's totally healthy. I wonder what that looked like. Even as I was reading my own notes, I, I thought, and I wonder what that looked like. His body was covered with open wounds and sores. I don't know if he lost any of his fingers or any, any limbs or his nose or ears. I don't know. But could you imagine if you were there watching this take place to see the man's body right in front of you transformed instantly from being so filled with, with open wounds and all to perfect skin condition? I can't imagine that for a moment. But the cleansing was immediate. And he's now totally healthy. And the joy and the wonder must have been amazing as he watches his own hands as they clear up immediately. That must have been immediate. It would have uh, uh, overwhelming. And, and as that takes place, I can't imagine the emotions that he's going through. And that he probably, well, look what he does. Well, Jesus speaks to him in verse 43 and says, listen. He strictly warns him. He sends him away at once. And he says, see that you say nothing to anyone. Go your way. Show yourself to the priest. Offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony. See that you say nothing to anyone. But he couldn't help himself. He had to say something. You see, the cleansing being immediate was something that was so astounding that, that, that all he could do was he had to say something. He knew that only God could cleanse a leper, and he knew the requirements that existed because Jesus says it. In Leviticus 14, there are requirements that had to be fulfilled. So Jesus tells him not to speak to anyone. Go show yourself to a priest. See, by going to a priest, he's a witness that God is at work and that God has come to them, and, and that will be a testimony to them. It'll show that, that Jesus is Messiah because that's something Messiah was going to do. In Matthew 11, verse 5, we have a, a, a verse that says, The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised. The good news is proclaimed to the poor. This is evidence that Messiah is amongst us. And so he says, go tell the priests as a, as a witness to them so that they will know only God cleanses a leper. Jesus Christ cleansed a leper. 
And they'll be able to see this witness. But notice verse 45. He went out and began to proclaim it freely to spread the matter. Now, someone wrote, we saw him earlier at his best, and now we see him at his worst. His disobedience deprived others of the touch of Jesus Christ. The man now can be in the city, but Jesus is no longer able to be in that city. You see, after cleansing him, the man remains, but Jesus leaves. He goes to deserted places because he can't minister anymore because the man had made such an issue over this that Jesus is no longer able to minister. Sometimes when the Lord says to you, this is something I've done for you, but keep it to yourself for a while, it's so that you don't steal a blessing from somebody else. In this particular case, he robbed a lot of people of blessings because he, making Jesus known, kept Jesus from being able to minister to the so, ma so many people who had need. He was no longer able to, to minister there. He went outside of the city. So he literally traded places with this man because the man had been outside of the city and now he's in the city. Jesus had been in the city, but now he has to go to deserted places like that man once had to. Now that's part one, part two, chapter two. Verse one, again, he entered Capernaum after some days and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, If I, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. And so Jesus is ministering, as we've seen throughout Galilee. It now becomes difficult for him to move about freely. He had withdrawn for a time. One commentator said it may have been more than weeks, it may have been several months that he had withdrawn, but he's returned to Capernaum. And after some days, it says that people took notice that he was there. The crowds are now following him. Word has spread that he's returned to the city of Capernaum once again, he goes to the, the home of Simon Peter. And it says in verse 2 that immediately many gathered together. There was no longer room to receive them. So word is spread that Christ is in town. And again, a, a crowd is gathered. They want to hear him. Now, there's a crowd. Jesus has the ability to do miracles. We've already seen that in chapter 1. So what is he going to do? What is he going to do now that he has a large crowd of people? Remember earlier, Peter had told Jesus that everyone is looking for you. Well, they still are. It's packed so tightly, there's no room for them in the home. There were so many that the doors were blocked by people. Now, in this crowd, and, and remember, I mentioned to you that Peter's home isn't a small home as was common during that day. He more than likely had what we today would refer to as a complex of homes because he had families living with him. He's a wealthy man or at least well off. He was well off enough to have partners in business. They would have built a larger home and all of that. So this is a good-sized place that Peter lives, but there are so many people there they can't even come in. As a matter of fact, the doors are blocked. There are people sitting there at the doorways, and they can't even walk in. And so there are a lot of people there, and, and when you look at a crowd, you'll always see this because in that crowd there'll be followers of Jesus, but the majority of those people are not followers. Jesus' miracles drew them. 
They wanted to see his works. And, uh, and, and whenever they know that a miracle worker is in town, of course they're going to want to go and see him. Because even to this day, there are those who advertise themselves as having a healing ministry and, and, and crowds will gather. So what does he do? Well, verse 2 tells us he preached the word to them. Again, there are curiosity seekers there, but there are also people in need of forgiveness. Now, he had come to preach. He had come to preach a gospel of salvation, and so he takes the opportunity to preach, and that's the center of his ministry, preaching the gospel. Again, in John 5, 24, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death into life. And so what he wants is these crowds to become his converts. He doesn't want people only to be there because they're curious to hear him. He doesn't want them there just because he may do a miracle. He wants them to be saved, and that's the reason why he preaches to them. That's why he ministers to them. And so it says that Jesus preached to them. He explained the scriptures. He presented himself as found in these, in these verses. He, he drew people to himself, and, and, and in the preaching, it even caused people to reject him, and this is what we'll see in a moment. You see, there are generally three Basic groups in gatherings like this. There are the followers of Christ to come to hear the word because they're hungry for truth. There are the curious who are part of a crowd, but they're not interested. And then there are the religious people who come looking for something to disagree with. Every time you have a, a good-sized crowd, a group of people, you're going, to have those three, you're going to have those three types of people in there. You're going to have the people who are hungry for truth, you're going to have the curious, the people who just go because they were invited. And then you're going to have the critics, the critics who are listening but finding something wrong. I've had that many times here. And that's why I don't let Marie come to church anymore. I've had, I've had that so many times. I, I can still remember one conversation after church I had with a woman who, who was wondering, why, why don't you have stained glass windows? I mean, they come and they got kind of interesting ideas. Anyway, that just came to mind. I shouldn't have told you that. But people come with different reasons. I'll put it that way. Sometimes they come not because they're interested, but because they want to criticize. And so what happens? Verse 3, they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. This man's incapable of moving on his own, so his friends bring him. As much as they loved their friend, they were incapable of healing him. They couldn't bring him the freedom that he needed. All they knew was that Jesus was there, and Jesus has the power to heal. Now, earlier we saw that Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases, and that would have included those who were unable to walk. It seems that the, the man had not been able to see the Lord when he had been there before, but Jesus is back in town, and his friends bring him, hoping for healing. Now, he couldn't come to Jesus without help, but he had friends, and they were there to help him. In Proverbs 17, 17, it says, A friend loves at all times a brother is born for adversity. And so, true friends will bring people to Christ. As true friends, they brought him because he was physically unable to come. Many people in this room were brought to Christ. You were crippled in life, incapable of having joy. Life on a mat, incapable of feeding yourself, cleaning yourself, taking care of your own basic needs. Life on a mat would be a very lonely, very lonely, very lonely life. A very painful one. When my mother went home to be with the Lord the last year that she was alive, she was confined to a bed for a year. My sister Rebecca would feed her, would bathe her, would help her with her basic needs that she had every day. And on top of that, my mother had developed dementia, very severe dementia. And on one occasion, my sister Becky was speaking to me, and she said to me, David, it's very hard. She says, it's not just the physical ministry that I do with my mom. She said, it's the emotional. I said, in what way, honey? And she said, well, she says, Mama has forgotten that Daddy died. She says, for you, you've had years to go on and to heal. She says, but Mama hasn't. 
Every day, she says, Mama asks me, where's my husband? She said, every day, I have to relive the death of my father. So there are things that we don't know about. There are things we don't think about. Can you imagine what it was like for this man to be on a mat with just his thoughts? He can't take care of himself. And he has friends, though. What a blessing, by the way, to have friends. He had four friends. And these friends would, would, would undoubtedly care for him, undoubtedly were there for him. What a blessing it is when you have someone who cares about you. And they know that Christ can do things because he had been in Capernaum. He had healed so many. There were so many healings and even the cleansing of this leper and all of that. Surely this man can do something for our friend. And so it's, it, it's noised about town. Christ is back. Jesus is in town. And they're speaking to their friend and they say, we need to get you to him. We need to bring you to him. He can do something for you. And uh, I normally will concentrate on the faith of the friends, but this man had faith also. And so there's no doubt in my mind that he says, take me, take me. So here they come carrying him. And as they're carrying him on this mat, you know, kind of like a stretcher, if you will, as they're bringing him, they come to the door, but they, they can't come in because there's too many people. They can't press in, get past. And so they don't know what to do. There's got to be something we can do. And these friends will not take no for an answer. You see, what they're going to do is they're going to get him somehow to Jesus and, and, and they're, going to, they're, going to, they're going to ask God, please do something for our friends. So these men cared for one another. And friends will always bring other friends to Christ. They couldn't get near to him, verse 4 tells us. So what do they do? Well, they, they climb the stairway that's next to the outside on the wall and they, care, they climb the stairway and they, they reach the rooftop and they begin to uncover the roof. Luke tells us that it was just too crowded to get in, so they went up to the side and, and they got to the roofing and it was just too hard for them to, to, uh, to get in through the, the doorway. So they, 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 they said to themselves, we're not going to take no for an answer. We're going to find out how we can do this. And so they're, there, they're on top of this roof and the roof is flat. It's overlaid with branches. It's covered with mud, straw and tiles. And so they determined where Jesus was and they began to break, break apart the roof. Now imagine for just a moment as they're working, this falling debris creates a billowy cloud. The particles begin to drift in the dust and people begin to look up and, and the sunlight begins to filter in as they see these fingers ripping open and now there's an opening and now this man is being lowered from this roof and is being placed right at the feet of Christ. Well, Jesus, it says, saw their faith. He saw the faith of this man and he saw the faith of his friends. And their faith, by the way, is revealed by their hard work to get to him. Genuine faith is always what is called a working faith. Genuine faith is, is, is part of a, a life that, that has been saved. And therefore, this genuine faith is a, is a faith that works on behalf of the Lord. And so the man, his faith is exposed and, and he, he, his friends bring him to Jesus Christ. Now, their faces would have been sweaty. Their hands would have been dirty from breaking up the roof. And they put in this hard work because they trusted that Jesus would minister. In James 2.17, James said, Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. But Jesus saw their faith. While Jesus sees their faith... But the people in the room see a mess and a commotion. And so in verse 5, when he saw this faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, what was outwardly obvious was that the man needed physical healing. What was hidden was that the man needed forgiveness. He needed to know that he could be forgiven of his sins because his sins had internally crippled him. There are so many people today who can physically walk but are paralyzed by sin. Sin cripples people. They become so guilty, they're depressed and unable to enjoy life. It reminds me of the psalmist David in Psalm 51.3 when he said, I know my transgressions 
My sin is always before me. You can be crippled in life because of something you've done. Many of you have experienced that. Perhaps some of you are going through that right now. You've done something and maybe few people know about it. But it's crippled you. It's made you depressed. It's, it's caused sorrow in your heart. It's taken the joy out of life. This man couldn't walk. But there was something worse in his life, and Jesus saw it. What was obvious was the man couldn't walk. What was not obvious was his heart. And Jesus could see what he was going through. Because what he needed wasn't simply to be able to walk. What he needed, and Jesus saw this, was to be saved. And that's why in verse 5, Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. When he says forgiven, you might find this interesting. The Greek word that is translated by the English word forgiven means to drive away or send away. Your sins have been driven away, is what he's saying. I'm sending your sins away. In Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I am moving your sins away. He needed forgiveness more than the ability to walk. What was worse than his paralysis was his guilt. In Matthew 16, 26, Jesus said, what good will it be for a man if he gains a whole world yet forfeits his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? You can have everything. Everything that you've ever desired. You can have every material benefit. You can even have perfect health. This man obviously didn't, but you can have perfect health, everything, but eventually you die. And then what? You know, they used to say the one who dies with the most toys wins. And then somebody said, no, the man who dies with the most toys still dies. You still die. And then what? Jesus said, you could gain the whole world. And lose your soul. What will you give in exchange for your soul? Well, this man wanted to be forgiven, and Jesus sees it. His need was not simply getting up and walking. His need was to be able to walk with God in his heart. That's where it all begins. Well, as this is taking place, and the Lord is speaking to him and all of, all of that, son, your sins are forgiven you. Verse 6, some of the scribes are sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? The scribes react. Notice it's internal. This man blasphemes. Who can forgive sins but God? They know that mere men cannot forgive sins. Only God can. Isaiah 43, 25, God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. I am the one who blots out your transgressions, and I do it for my own sake. Well, they instantly understood that Jesus was saying something, and they connected. He was claiming to be God. And that gave these hostile religious leaders the information they wanted. They can discredit him now as a sinful blasphemer. Well, Jesus immediately, verse 8, perceives in his spirit that they're reasoning like that within themselves. And so he responds in a way that confirms his deity he responds to their thoughts, which confirm that he's God in the flesh. It says in Psalm 44, 21, he knows the secrets of the heart and he performs a work that reveals his divine power and authority. So he says in verse nine, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or say to him, arise, which is going to be easier. Your sins are forgiven you or arise, take up your bed and walk, which would be easier. Well, to say someone is forgiven is a lot easier than to heal that person physically. One is an act that isn't obvious, but the other is immediate and visible. Which is easier? Well, he says in verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Jesus forgives every manner of sin that occurs before you die. I'm not going to ask you to rehearse in your own mind your secret sins, but aren't you glad that he does forgive you of every sin? Aren't you glad that he cleanses you of all unrighteousness? Aren't you glad that the blood of Jesus Christ that was poured out for our behalf is able to forgive every single sin that we have? 
In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from some sin. No, cleanses us from all sin, every sin, even that sin that you hate to remember you did. Every stinking sin has been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Every one. Now, some of you are young and you say, well, I'm not that bad. Grow up. Grow older. The list grows. The list grows every day. At 10 or 12, maybe you don't have that many sins you're aware of. I remember hearing a little girl, hearing of a little girl. She was around seven years old and she came to Christ and she said, Before I came to Jesus, I was a terrible sinner. And you can't help but think, Really? What did you do? You didn't make your bed. You, you terrible little sinner, you. But when you see somebody who's in their 20s or in their 30s or 40s, and sometimes I've seen people in their late 70s and they come forward and give their hearts to Christ, a lifetime of sin, a lifetime of anger, a lifetime of bitterness, a lifetime filled with profanity, perhaps immorality, a lifetime of habits that, that were so, so, so horrible that they were paralyzed, that a lifetime of hurting other people, a, a lifetime of destroying relationships, a lifetime of sin. And then they then they say, God, God, can you, would you, can you? And he said, there's not a sin that I can't forgive. There's not a sin I won't forgive. But you need to turn from it. You need to repent from it. You need to desire my forgiveness. And yes, I can give it to you. All you need to do is ask and repent. That's all you need to do. And this man's on this mat and 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 this conversation, though it's before so many, yeah, imagine that it's before so many people and it's a mess in there. Because when you deal with sin, often there's a mess, and there's a mess in there. There's all these people sitting around. There's the religious leader sitting more than likely in the front row just watching this, reasoning amongst themselves. Who is this man? Who is this man who forgives sin? Who is this man that blasphemes? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, looks at them. Can you imagine that? You're sitting in the front row. You're doing that thing. And he looks at him and says, which is easier? Yeah, oh, that would, I'd love to have been there. I would have just to watch Jesus and watch his face. Which is easier? To say a man can rise up and walk or to say his sins are forgiven. Which is easier? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say unto you, rise and walk. Can you imagine that? And every, oh, the, the hush that would have taken place in that room. The quietness as this man begins to rise up. And they, they know who he is. And he begins to rise he arose and he went out in the presence of them all. They watched him. Undoubtedly, he took that mat that he had been on and walked out of that room. Invisible forgiveness was demonstrated by visible healing. The crippled man was made to walk through faith and obedience because Jesus gave him a command that was impossible I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. That is impossible. Let me remind you, they just had to break a roof to let me in before you, and you're telling me to get up and walk home? Are you kidding me? But he did instantly. Can you imagine that? He got up, and he walks out, and the silence that would have taken place in that room, the, and then the murmuring that begins and it says, immediately as he arose and he took up the bed, he went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. The, it would have been a loud raucous. It would have been noise. They would have been grabbing. Did you see that? Did you see that? I, it, he gave this impossible command, yet they responded. In Luke chapter 5, verse 25 and 26, immediately he rose up before them, took up what had, he had been lying on, departed to his own house, glorifying God. They were all amazed. They glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we've seen strange things today. They were all amazed. The miracle brought glory to God, it drew people to Jesus Christ. In Micah 7, 18, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. 
When you came to the Lord and you said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he delighted to show you mercy. Do you know that? He delighted to show you mercy. I want to show you mercy. I want to show you mercy. When my kids were growing up and they did something that was wrong, more than once I said to them, please just repent. Please repent. I don't want to kill you. Please repent. I want to show you mercy. I delight in showing mercy. I want to. I want you to be blessed. I want you to have joy. I want you to. But when you do something that is wrong, I have to bring uh, discipline upon you. I delight to show mercy. Every parent in this room does too. God showed mercy to you. Don't forget that. God delights in showing mercy to you. He forgives every sin. There's not a sin you've, you've ever sinned that God is incapable of forgiving if you turn from it and ask. God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. It's one of the wisest prayers you could ever pray because God delights to show his mercy. And when you say, God, I'll turn from it, and I want to turn to you. Lord, I'm crippled because my life has been messed up. God says, you know, I can heal you. There isn't a broken life I can't repair. There isn't a broken mind that I can't heal. I can do that work if you come to me. And thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. And then when that happens, what do you do? Well, when you're made to walk, you're a testimony of his power. Because when people see what happened to you, they will say, I want that to happen to me. And as I've shared so many times, the very first person that I ever brought to faith in Christ, I didn't even know I did. I didn't even know I did bring them to faith in Christ. It was my sister Madeline, who when she saw me come home the day I got saved and was speaking to me, she said to me later, she said, you know, David, when you came home, she said, you wouldn't know this, when you came home that day and you told me how you gave your heart to Christ and he had saved you, she said, I put my head on the pillow when I went to bed and I said, whatever you did for my brother, please do it for me. She said, that's how I got saved. She said, it's what God did for you. I wanted it to be done for me. And when that happened, that's what touched my father who told me I knew that I was better than you and yet I wasn't as good as your sister. So I needed a savior the way you did. And that's how my mother was touched. And then a couple of years later, two and a half years or so later, that's how my sister led a girl named Marie to Christ at a Bible study I was teaching. Because this girl Marie was religious, but didn't have a relationship with God. And the chain keeps going and going and going. Because one person's life was touched, and that person's life touched others. And it's all the same message. You can't walk because you're a sinner, but Jesus says, I can make you walk. You don't have community because you're a leper. You're cut off from God, but Jesus says, I will. I can make you clean. What a Savior that we serve. What a Savior. And Lord, we just bless you for these stories, these snapshots of your life and mercy to us. Lord, the cleansing of a leper and the healing of a, of a crippled man. And Lord, there are those in this room right now who are spiritually in those conditions. There are those watching right now who are spiritually in that kind of condition. I'm asking that you, by your mighty Holy Spirit, would touch our hearts and draw us to yourself today, Lord. Lord, there are various countries I'm familiar with that are right now watching online, people in different places throughout the world who couldn't be here, but they're watching right now. I pray that you would be with them. And Lord, I'm asking that you would speak to them right now, that they might open their heart and say, if, you, if you're willing, you can make me clean. If you're willing, you can forgive me. And I ask in Jesus' name that you would do that as their hearts are opening to you. And even in this room or perhaps in the overflow, if you have a need to get right with the Lord right now, in this room I can see you. If you need prayer, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right now. 
Father, you see these hands that are going up in this room. You know the reason why each hand is being raised to you. And I ask in Jesus' name that you would reach down and you would touch every person who right now is opening their hearts to you. Wash them and cleanse them, Lord, for you are willing and able. And have your way in them, I would pray. And Jesus, as we open up to you and say, God, be merciful, I pray that you will show your abundant mercy. And Lord, we receive by faith and we will walk by faith from this point on, cleansed by your blood and healed. So Lord, as we leave this place in a moment, go with us. We will follow you the rest of our lives. Bless you and thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And I ask Jesus, you keep moving to your own glory in your name. Amen.